Available on all streaming platforms, it's professional wrestling's greatest, largest, privately owned wrestling library. All the classic hits, flips, slams, and pins of yesteryear are on one place. It's Ultimate Classic Wrestling. Check out the Nature Boy Ric Flair, Hulk Hogan, Mr. USA Tony Atlas, Tito Santana, Rick Martel, a who's who of professional wrestling's greatest spotlight stars ever to grace the squared circle all in one place. Grab the best seat in the house for memories and mayhem on Ultimate Classic Wrestling. Hi, this is Bob Smith. You might remember me from my years at Pro Wrestling Illustrated Magazine. Well, now I've started a brand new podcast called The Outdated Wrestling Hour. Yes, we're going to take a whimsical look back at the wrestling figures, stars, and trends from years gone by. We're talking 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, and a whole lot more. There's going to be laughs. There's going to be fun. There's going to be action. You name it. Please tune in for The Outdated Wrestling Hour wherever you get your podcasts. Wrestling fans, promoters, wrestlers, and anyone who enjoys pro wrestling now have something New to be excited about, the Wrestling Fans International Association, the WFIA, is back. WFIA is an association that exists to promote, grow, and support professional wrestling throughout the world. Membership is free. Your membership includes a free, digital, bi-monthly publication of the Wrestling Fan News newsletter, association updates, voting privileges, and much more. Please go to the WFIA.org, that's T H E W F I A.org, and become a member today. Hey, this is the one man gold mine, the one man enterprise of professional wrestling and all entertainment, Flynn Hendricks. And you better believe when I'm looking for a good podcast to listen to, I go to my own. I go to the I Know You Hear Me podcast hosted by me. Glenn Hendricks. That is such a fresh perspective for how you should look at life, too. Like, I just, I love that. And then when I'm feeling spooky, I go to my other podcast, Tales from the Haunt, where myself, yeah. I want my head shoved inside a 15-pound silicone mask more. <laughs> you know, I want to have a bucket of sweat coming off me at the end of the night. And just Jeff. Dogs don't like eggs, <laughs> <laughs> I hate you so much. <laughs> Talk to other scare actors about what it takes to get into the world of scare acting. So if you're curious about how people became professional wrestlers, actors, prioritized their mental health, became entrepreneurs, avoided burnout, or got into scare acting, you need to go check out I Know You Hear Me and Tales from the Haunt, available on all podcasting platforms. And I know you hear me. Welcome, everybody, to uh, the PWZ Podcast. I want to thank everybody for tuning in. This one's a very special interview. To me, it's a very special interview. Uh, There's a lot of interest in this one, and... uh, I hope everybody enjoys this. Fans of uh, Savoldi's, ICW, IWCCW. We have Mike Williams here, also known as uh, Zip from the Equalizers, and uh, wrestled uh, under. Uh, you wrestled under some other gimmicks too, correct? Yeah, quite a few. Whatever, whatever yeah. the promoter wanted, I would, I would do. He put me under a hood. I put a hood on. I didn't really care. Uh, yeah. Years ago, I was talking to Crusher Crew Chef in uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico. He told me. You need to get somewhere and work as much as you can. So when we went to work for Saboldi's, they would do a TV and they'd ask us to work a few times. And they come up with the George Gorillas and the Russian Assassins. And I've worked as a Russian prior to going to work for them for some other people. And to be honest, that was the easiest way for me to get into business. Cut my hair and got a Russian flag and and that shit I got on the road. But uh, they... They furnish us a lot of work, you know what I'm saying? So it, it was you could get, you know, start polishing your art up. Uh, do you mind uh, me asking, how yeah, did you get it? Uh, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, oh, I just want to start with how did you uh, get into the, the business of professional wrestling? Where did you start? Well, I started in uh, Louisiana, but uh, I was boxing – and I signed a contract in Peabody, Massachusetts, Peabody, with yep. Jack Vile. And I come home one day, and my dad said, what are you doing here? I said, they want to get me down to 147 pounds. He said, can you? I said, yeah, if I starve myself. He said, uh, that's what you should do. I said, what's that? He said, right there on TV, you should wrestle. I said, wrestle? He said, yeah. He said, 
you'll never have to diet again. You can eat, the, you'll be able to eat the fattest steaks and travel around the country. And <laughs> shit, he said, it's a bunch of bullshit. He said, you'll fit right in with it. So I had a young man introduce me to Ricky Farrar. And Ricky Farrar asked me a few questions. He said, what do you think about wrestling? I said, well, I think they're all athletes. If you want to ask me the truth, you know, saying, I said, uh, he said, well, if you believe that, he said, I can help you. So, and later on, I, I was in like at Albuquerque when I was talking about Crusher Khrushchev, he had asked me who broke me into business. And I told him Ricky Farrar broke me into business. And I noticed I was looking at Ric Flair because that's the first time I got next to Ric Flair and he was lacing up his boots and he turned around, he come over and shook my hand. He goes, he said, Ricky broke me into business. Said, How's Ricky doing? And I, I can't remember Ricky's wife's name, but all the boys knew her because she did the income tax for everybody. And at that point there, you know, it just uh, in the South, if you weren't with Bill Watts and and that you had, you know, it was hard to really, you know, Texas All-Star was folding basically. I did some work with Texas All-Star and I run into a young man by the name of Dale Wolf. Dusty Wolf, he wrote a book called The German Wrestler, I believe. And he was just a nice guy. I told him, where can I get some work at? And he said, well, come over here. Got an ink pen. I go, yeah. So he started writing down different names of companies and who to call. And at that point there, I ended up in New Jersey. And uh, I worked for the NWF, which was uh, DC Drake. He won some good cards. They had people like John yeah. Dunn on the cards and that. I worked with uh, Jewel Strongbow. With, you know, with the NWF, you, didn't, you weren't working all the time. So when I got to start working, well, actually, I went to New York City and met Johnny Ross. And from Johnny Ross, we hooked up with uh, the Savoldis. And the Savoldis, between the Savoldis and several independents, we started doing pretty good. Me and uh, well, his name was Johnny Grunge, but back then it was Mike Durham was his real name. And uh, he passed away a few years ago. Good kid. Uh -huh. yeah. And uh, we we just started bouncing around wherever we get working. With the Savoldis, which Mario Savoldi and his, his cousin, they were real good to us. And uh, Tony Rumble, and, you know, got to work with Tommy Dreamer and, then another DQ and the Madison brothers, they called them. And they even had a group called the undertakers that worked for them. Yeah. But, um, we're working with cutchers and several places like that. But when we got to, we got to do more work when we got better at the business. And from there, they got, they went to go overseas a few times and Bahamas, the Cayman Islands with FD delivery Jones. So, you know, I most probably made more money being a wrestler than wrestling, you know, um, uh, I worked like with Ricky Steamboat one time with the WWF and I was on a job in New York, not New York in uh, Chicago. And the kid seen me, uh, he goes, you're, you're, my, you're Mike Lane. Huh? I said, yeah. He said, come see this. And he showed me, I said, where did you get that? It was, I was new to the telephone and I didn't know all the matches were on TV. I never, actually, I didn't see many of my matches, to be honest. And so he, sh uh, he showed me that. And next thing you know, I'm all across the job. And, uh, it's same thing. I had a wrestling, uh, I hate to call them marks, but as a man, a big wrestling fan. Yeah. And I was at Intel and I just got out the business and he set me up over supervision. And it was because I was a wrestler. And then, you know, you, you make a quarter million a year, you know, because you were a wrestler, not because of, I didn't wrestle, but because I was a wrestler, he liked the idea that he had a wrestler working for him. Right. And, uh, I would tell you my honest opinion when I see people that's been in a business and uh, that don't do well in life after the business, I can't understand what they learn in the business. I use the same thing they taught me in the beginning. The promoter's always right. Yeah. If you got an ideal, give it to him, but let it be his ideal. And I use that same philosophy on uh, construction and other jobs I worked on. And uh, they quite, they quite well. Now, I was working for the GWF and Global Wrestling Federation. It was in Dallas, which was a long drive from Lake Charles. I moved back to the South and, uh, you, uh, as working with the long shore, we load rice and the, the business agent, he was a big time wrestling fan and shoot. We, I was number three, uh, 264 on the floor. That's my number. When you get, you get, they got to have 264 jobs before I can go to work. And mm -hmm. if I didn't go to work one night, I'd get home and he'd call me. Hey, wrestler. That's what he called me. Hey, wrestler. Somebody didn't show up to work. Come on in. They only got one gang working. You know what I'm saying? So uh, you wouldn't believe who wrestling fans are. I'd, uh, I was uh, doing, guess, uh, 
I was doing jobs for the WWF and I come home to Louisiana, you know, and you're thinking you're doing a job getting beat, you know, four, three, four minute match. You know, you say, well, you know, the money's real good. But they had a senator in the state of Louisiana. He come up and said, Mike, I seen you wrestling the other day on TV. I thought, what? And so you don't know who the wrestling fan is. You Mm -hmm. know, so it's a a good business. Uh, I got hooked up with Yokozuna years ago. And uh, he was teaching wrestling for uh, Buffalo Jim Bear in Las Vegas. And uh, Yoke would go out of out of the country to work, and he'd let me run the school for him. And I got paid good money work for Buffalo. And uh, but you can't, you know, you can't. Uh, it's just they give you, they, you know, in Las Vegas, you got a lot of stuff going on. And so he would have me going to little talk shows and stuff like that all the time. We didn't wrestle as much as we did in, up in New York in that area because there's just not that many shows in Las Vegas. Right. But it was it was a good run for me. Yeah. Look, uh, I, I talk forever. No, that's good. That's what we're here for. <laughs> that's what we're here for. We're here to share memories of the world of professional wrestling, your time in wrestling. And, uh, uh, you know, um, what year was this that you started about? Did you did you say that year? Well, I... Uh, 1984, I started training, okay. and uh, man, I couldn't. I, I talked to Grizzly Smith, mm-hmm. and he kind of he was, you know, that's hard business to get in at that time, right. and so you know, uh, he kind of gave me a little push off, but not wasn't ugly to me, but it wasn't real receptive. Right. And at that point, I said, "Well, I'm in great shape." I went and he- hung the heavy bag out, and uh. Started training like 27 rounds, four minutes, resting 30 seconds. I'm gonna go back in the box. What the hell? And then I got a telephone call. It was uh Buck Rowley, Frank, I don't know what Frank's real name is, but Buck Rowley called me and we started working for him. Me and the kid that uh I sent you a little clip, and that was in 1986. That's before the Ultimate Warrior was mm-hmm. the Ultimate Warrior. And I went to work for the Von Erics in Dallas, and I'm sitting there. And right across from me, I, I call uh, Jim Helwick. And he's sitting there as the yeah. Dingo Warrior. And I look at him, I go, you know, the Dingo Warrior, that's a black man's name. I said, the Ultimate Warrior would be a good name for you. And a few months later on, maybe four or five months later, he was working as the Ultimate Warrior for New York. And uh, I never said nothing to him asking for a favor, but uh, uh, just very, you know, he was a good guy. I worked on some shows overseas with him. Jim Higgy Wiggy, that's what the, the Sheik would call him. <laughs> I spent some time with the Sheik. Uh, the Sheik, uh, oh man. He uh, would always carry his pictures around with him and give them and pass them out. And uh, I guess uh, Tony Atlas really helped me get a push with, uh, with the Savoldis. Yeah. Because we walked into a dressing room in Connecticut, and it's the first time we ever worked for them. And they had these two big boys, Thunder Mountain. And Hoss. And Hoss about 400 and something pounds. A big old boy. He loved to play softball. But he was getting on Mike Durham's case and he's like threatening him. You know, I'll whip your ass. And I told him, hey, big boy. I said, uh, you're not going to put a hand on him. And he goes, what? I said, you're not, you're not touching him. He's with me. I said, uh, you're not touching. And Tony Atlas was sitting right over there. And uh, so a little later on, Tony called me over there. He said, were well, you going to fight that big boy? I said, yeah. He said, uh, think you could have won? I said, I don't know. But I said, he wasn't touching the kid. I said, Mike Durham's a few years younger than me. And right. uh, I said, he wasn't touching the kid, not long without fighting me. And he goes, I like you. And next thing you know, we get another call. We're going back to work for Saboldi's again and several times, you know. Um, went overseas with Tony. I watched him bench press just under 600 pounds. Wow. And what was funny about it, I go to the gym and uh, I think it was five, 585. I would kind of give him a help up. And I take one full step back from the from the barbell and put my hands behind my back because he won't let everybody know that nobody helps him lift his weights. And so he did the bench press. And now we go to outside of Vienna, Austria, I believe. And I could be wrong about the place, but they're going to do a TV on him and he's going to bench press. And so we get over there. I don't spot him. They got SD Delivery Jones and maybe Ted Petty and uh. Maybe Mike Trout, I don't forget, he had three people spotting him, and boy, he jumps up and he heads butt the 
the weight and he moves around, he screams, he hollers and he shakes. And I say, afterwards, I look at him and go, Tony, I never seen you do none of that stuff before. He says, the TV camera was on Mike. You got to put a show on for the people. <laughs> so Tony, Tony real, you know, very humble fella, you know, more, more humble than you'd think. Yeah. Um, he stayed at my house several times and I'd wake up in the morning and all the dishes would be washed. You know, he'd wash the dishes, go down to the diner who would never bother nobody. You know, we did have Carrie Von Eric stay at the house one time and my wife had cooked a nice big roast and we're eating the roast. I believe it was Carrie, Ronnie Garvin, and uh, most probably Tony was there. And my wife had cooked a big roast and I watched Carrie cut off about half of it and he was going for the rest of it. And I said, I, to I said, Gary, there's, there's other people here got to eat. <laughs> but, uh, you know, with that family, you wonder what went on, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. But, uh, uh, yeah, he was, uh, he was something else. I go to the gym with him and lift weight. And, uh, Tony hooked me up with a bunch of people from, a from New Jersey that he knew, which, uh, some of them were the gimmick people, you know what I'm saying? If you want to lift weights and grow. And uh, I hooked up with John a lamb. He was real good. He tried the business, but he really couldn't make it around. It wasn't for him. And was, some people let their pride in wrestling uh, dictate how far they'll go. And right. me, you know, there, there's no shame in this game. It's, it's show business, 100%. You know, and uh, you got to be an athlete. Kurt Angleton was one of the best athletes in the world. Yeah. You know, uh, and Sean Michaels, give him a lot of credit. Uh, Sean, the same night I was talking to Grizzly Smith, Sean was on the, he was doing jobs for, uh, for uh, Bill Watts, you know. And if he, if he wrestled 180 times that year, he lost 180 times. But he never gave up. He never quit. You know, I run into him. I did a, uh, I'll try anywhere I'd go, I'd carry my bags with me. And I had the phone numbers that Dale Wolfie gave me. I call him Dusty. And I would, I would call whatever promotion was that area. Can you just get me on a show while I'm here? And in Florida championship wrestling, I run into the nasty boys down there. And, uh, uh, they, uh, they're strong, but, uh, yeah. but Sean Michael was there. And, uh, he told me, you uh, know, one day I'm gonna be the WWF world champion. That's my goal. And in <laughs> Buffalo, New York, he told me, you know, I seen him in the hallway with just me and him and, uh, and Vince had come by and talked to us for a minute. And he says, uh, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna be the world champion. He said, Hulk Hogan's getting old. And it wasn't long after that, you know, uh, he wasn't tag team and he became the world champion. And his work really exceeded after that. You know, uh, wrestling is like playing baseball. If I had to be, you know, you the baseball, they play hundreds of games a year, and these fellows get real good at it. The more you wrestle, the better you'll get at it. And uh but the business, you know, if people really look at it today, I had a lady when I was working with Yoko, she brought her son up there and want to know, would he make it to the WWE? I told her, ma'am, he stands a better chance of going to Hollywood and storing in a motion picture. She goes, what? I said, ma'am, there's, there's only so many people up there. I mean, you got X amount of football teams, so many basketball teams, and they make a lot of movies today. If you really want to be a star, send them to Hollywood because <laughs> It'd be, it's a hard thing to do, you know. Uh, I'm from a rural town of Louisiana. Most probably when I left Louisiana, there wasn't 3,200 people in my little town. And it's quite a few square miles. Right. And it was this bigger in Manhattan. And so, you know, it's just farmland and everything. But I never took it as a – I went on with it, and i am just be straight honest. I started making about – started making about 100 then up to $150, sometimes $200 a night. And uh, I figured, man, if I work five days a week, that's $750. That's more than I make it work. And I can lift weights. Shoot, this is great. Now, buddy of mine fought Jerry Cooney after that. And I, I'm a, I was a pretty good little fighter, but he fought Jerry Cooney and he made $125,000. Well, I broke out the calculator and seen how many $150 nights I'd have to make to make $125,000. So, you know, it kind of upset my stomach. Damn. You know, but uh, again, I was stressed. 
I made a lot of money being a raffle. I mean, you know, and, and you didn't didn't have to work it too much, you know. It just it just kind of come come real nice, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Uh, you're a this a Voldies. How would I say this? They uh I believe they got caught with their pants down. What I mean by that, the wrestling business was changing fast. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And Vince McMahon had a great mind. He had a great mind for the business. And uh, I would, when I go to the WWF shows, I would sit back in the back and watch what was going on. You know, and I'd stay to the end of the show. Mm-hmm. And this is, you know, but the Savoldis, you know, they had that old time wrestling. They were going this, that. But he, he really steamrolled everybody. He bought all the talent. But what was good about working with the Savoldis, they would use the talent after they left the WWF. I got to rest with uh, Kim Patera, Cowboy Ace, Bob Barton a few times. And, you know, these, you know, just these boys, you know, he was in WrestleMania, Cowboy Bob Barton. And Kim yeah. Patera, that's the world's strongest man. Tony Atlas, he was he was something else, you know. Uh, Tony was basically the face of that company yeah. for a number of years, like being the champion. And, you know, then he was like the top heel for the company as well for quite a few years. Yeah. Well, Tony. Tony, uh, I seen him. I haven't talked to him in years, uh, mm-hmm. but I seen a, a video or something on TV the other day, and he looked like he still goes to the gym. You know, he looked like he still. I saw training. him. I saw him about two years ago. He did a, a signing at uh, you know Mario Mancini. Uh, he runs a school here. Yeah. He runs show. He runs shows out of his school, and he had Tony in as a guest. Um, this is about two years ago now. So, and Tony still looks like Tony. Tony Atlas still looks like Mr. USA. So, there's no denying it who he is. <laughs> so, he looks good. Oh, he, you can look up, you can find old magazines when he was bodybuilding. He, uh, yeah. he competed with uh, the competition against uh, Joe Wilder, Wilder, mm-hmm. I believe it is. He was with the other company. And, uh, but he did real good, but he was, he made big money. You know, as a young age, you know what I'm saying? He was over pretty good. Right. And I'm talking about with Crockett. And then they give him a little push. You know, the WWF, I tell you, I used to sit in the back and I would, you know, I was always told, don't leave the show early in case they need you for something. Even though it was a TV production, I'd hang around to the last minute. And uh, I was a little tight and I called it bonus because all the boys were, stay at the Hilton and all that. And I couldn't stay at the Hilton, you know, I want to watch my money, but they would leave all the Hilton towels, the Marriott towels. And I brought a special duffel bag and I load all them towels up after every show. And I was shag with them. I had more fluffy towels than you can, you know, I probably could have made a living selling them towels. <laughs> but, uh, at the, you know, you know, we got the um, Greg, the hammer Valentine, a good guy. Uh, I work, I didn't work with Rick Rude, but I got to met Mick, meet Rick on a on a better level when he worked for the Savoldis, you know what I'm saying? Real friendly. Uh he took his vitamins and all that stuff. And you'll notice a lot of the top boys, you know, they were real uh real keen on that. They you know they watched what they ate in that. Now Rick Mortel, Rick Mortel sat me one down one day and he's looking at me and I was eating at one of Vince's shows. He goes, Hey kid, you need to take the skin off the chicken. And I'm thinking to myself, I just want to eat the skin. That's the best flavor, you know. That's the flavor. That's the best you in the right flavor. direction. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm eating the skin, you know. I eat a little better today than I did then. <laughs> so, uh, in 1988, you were in WWF. You wrestled guys like uh, Jake Roberts and Sam Houston. What was Sam Houston like at that time? Well, I wrestled Sam Houston then. And I wrestled him, and I met his daddy again later on in Louisiana when I come back down here, and I okay. think on the better terms. But uh, Jake, you know, I don't care what anybody says about Jake. We went overseas with him on a tour, and he's just, uh, you know, a sweetheart, man. He wouldn't let us pay for nothing. We sat down to really? eat with him, and he he covered, he covered the bill. You know, I told him, hey, man, I said, no, I said, don't worry. I said, I done sent all my money home. He said, I only keep my promo money when he sells pictures mm-hmm. and he had a kid selling, you know, would take the pictures with a Polaroid and he making 3,500, 
4,500 was his best night, 45, 4,700 on a night wow. on a little tour through Germany and Austria, you know, and, uh, but, uh, I also, uh, Mick Foley, you got to give him a lot of prop. You know, I like to say something about him cause he's a good guy. He traveled with me one time and we pulled into a Wendy's and uh, I'm going to eat the double meat cheeseburger. I remember I got a union construction job since I was 22 years old. I got a union when I was 19. And uh, I turned out at 22, and uh, I made good money my my whole life in construction. And so when I but I watched him, Mick Foley, when he opened up his little change purse, he counted out a few quarters, a few dimes, some nickels, and the pennies. He gave me exactly the money they had. He pushed it across that ta- that counter, and I said, "Man." This fellow, you know, he's he's really wants to get in this business. He sacrificed a lot, you know. You know, if you just that's all you do, and he finally made it up, you know, to a, you know, a good level. You know what I'm saying? I think he's one of the top rousers of all times. I believe I read the other day. So you know, and there was, I tell you, who made a lot of money being a wrestler. I'm gonna switch gears. Sunny Beach, and that's a good guy. Yeah. And uh, I was always a fan of his. And, uh, you know. But he opened up a little security business. He he does quite well, but he Mm -hmm. was always real polite. And one day he asked me, he goes, how many times are you working this month? I said, I'm booked right now on uh, 12 shows. He said, I'm only booked on on two. I said, how much are you asking for? He goes, 500 a night. I said, I said, said, when you look at that arena, Sonny, I said, and and that there's only, you know, 950 people there. They can't pay you the same money they pay you in the WWF. He right. says, oh, you're right. I said, yeah. You know, I look at the house, you know what I'm saying? So, but having a construction job through the union, I was a union pipe fitter, and later on I got a union electrician. And uh, I always had health and welfare, 401K, a pension. You know, if you if you don't know what you're doing in life, uh, I wouldn't tell you to join the Army. I'd tell you to join the union. You know, for people right. working on the union labor, they live pretty good. You know, that's I'm probably going to give the union a promo. But uh, I love, yeah. I love the business though. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Me and uh, Ted, 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 he was a good guy. Now that's you know he he had he had all angles covered. You know, he had a box truck with a ring. He worked. You know what I'm saying? So he he put on a double payday. Right. You know, I kind of, I kind of, I, I thought I tried to do that later on in life, but in the South, there's no money down here. You need to be honest. Right. And I work, I work for, uh, for global and you really couldn't make no money. Now they, they did me good, you know, work with Bradshaw, Layfield, Duncan, uh, and, um, several other boys, but they always did me good. I should have did a program with Kerry Von Eric and for some reason, I didn't make it to the show and they never gave me an opportunity to do it again. And he killed himself not long after that, but I worked with him, you know, uh, in new Orleans one time, you know, he's in the crowd loves him. I remember when he went with the, the, the WWF and he was out there and the ultimate warrior was most probably he was on top. You know, they take yep. pictures of him all the time. When Kerry hit that ring, pop, 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 you know, they just pictures, there were flashes everywhere. I said, he's strong and he ain't been here long either. You know what I'm saying? But uh, when you talk about Sam Houston earlier, I worked with him in, uh, in a little, what he, it was a, a little building on the weekends. You know, they would wrestle there periodically and then they would uh, have cockfights on Sunday. So, you know, <laughs> that's the crowd you would get there. Right, because uh, cockfight was legal at that time in Louisiana, and uh, I started work for Skeet U at Laranja, Louisiana. And when I mentioned Laranja one day, Ted DiBiase, all them boys, they sort of said, "Hey, is Skeet still running? Does he have the Does he have the flea market on the weekend? And does he run his little flat track? He had a little track there, so he'd have wrestling, let's say, a Friday night, and then he'd have a a race track the next day. And but he." All the boys, you know, that were, you know, they would go to LaRange, Louisiana. It's a little small town. And on the door, of the uh, the doors, they had good guys and bad guys. You know what I'm saying? And uh, I was working with that kid, Ken Fletcher. And uh, I took and 
threw him outside the ring and bounced his head off uh off the you know off the mat. Yeah. And I turned around, this lady stood up out of a wheelchair and she threw a coke in my face. And she had to be be 75 or older. And so man, I you know what what you gotta do, you know? So I get back in the ring, I wipe the coke off my face, we finish the match. Now I get to the dressing room. And there's a knock on the door, and there's this big black sheriff, about six foot nine. He looks like he's a basketball player on steroids. He goes, Mike Lane. I go, yeah. He goes, I've been coming here for seven years now. And that's the first time I seen Miss Betty get out of that wheelchair when she threw that coke in your face. Ha oh, ha he started laughing. I, said, I was so happy. I thought he was gonna arrest me or something. Shit. <laughs> big old man. But you know, I always uh, I must. I went to, I'm a, the Phoenix, Arizona, and that was for the WWF to do some to do a job, and I talked to Tony Gurria, and I had my wife there with me, and I had three daughters, and this young man walks in, and he looks at my daughters and he goes, I know what you little girls like, y'all like cookies, huh? So he goes over to get my girls some cookies. Then he comes back and he says, I know it goes good with cookies. He goes, milk. And that was The Rock. And this is when he was the heel of the show. That's a very humble young man. You know, people don't understand, you know. And he said something the other day. I seen him on a TV thing. You know, he goes, always send the fans home happy. And then I could have it off a little bit, but that's what he said. And that's a great statement, you know what I'm saying? And to me, that's, that's what professional wrestling really was making people happy. If you can make somebody happy in life, that's a good thing. You know, they go down there and they get to scream and holler and take frustration out. You know what I'm saying? So getting somebody to throw a Coke on you ain't really a bad thing. That's not the first time they threw a Coke at me. I went with the Zavoldis to the Bahamas and uh, it was real strange because the dressing was pretty dark. And, you know, we get there, I I'm, I'm, believe I'm, I'm doing a Russian gimmick at the time. And uh, Molotov Koloff, and uh, I met uh, Ivan Koloff not long after I started doing that gimmick. And he asked me, how are you doing? I said, making a lot of money. He goes, good. But uh, so I didn't know if he'd be pissed off or not. But um, so when we go to the ring, they got chicken wire about 10 foot all along the aisle. And it goes over the top. And then when you get to the ring, you know, there's chicken wire over the ring. And they got an old-fashioned tub with a light in it like a five gallon tub on the ring and you notice when you're getting it out there it's an open air arena and all of a sudden i started hearing them go ah and they start throwing bottles from outside the arena onto where the ring is and as the bottles would hit the ring later on they would bust and you'd have glass in the ring i said man and then uh then they take a little sock and they roll them around, they throw them at you. And if it was soft, you knew what it was. It was a rat. If it was hard, they put a battery. I found out it's better to get hit in the back with a with a rat than it is with a battery. So, but you know, that is a little crude, but you know, you never know. <laughs> That's wild. <laughs> that is just crazy. Oh, yeah. You know, yeah, you know. Oh shit. You're talking about global. But I've, uh, before, so uh, what had, did you encounter Joe Petticino? Was he still working with them at the time? I think Joe, I don't, I couldn't, I can't, I didn't really get the only person I really associated with there was Scandal Ragbor. And the okay. reason I got hooked up with Scandal Ragbor is because uh, Ivan, uh, Ivan Putsky and his boy mm -hmm. were working for the uh, for Mario Savoldi. Yeah, you know, they had stayed in the house one time. And uh when I, I called him one day, I said, Look, I'd like to go work for Global. He said, uh, I'm in Louisiana. Do you, do you know anybody over there? He said, Yeah, I know somebody. I'll give him a call. And then I, I got a call and they pretty much would put me on their TVs. They let me do a little commentating. I could have took better advantage of it, but it's a long drive from my house to Dallas all the time. And uh so I, I just I didn't really bow out. I most probably moved to Las Vegas. And that's Las Vegas is like being on an island. There's a lot going on in Las Vegas. You can go to Hooters and being a wrestler. You know, they want me to go to Hooters. I did a bathing suit contest and they had a Connie and Gary talk show. And 
one of the uh, the boys that uh the three stooges i believe one of their sons or shimp or one anyway they have a, a radio talk show and he was always this uh, the promoter there was buffalo jim bear and he would always have something for me to do go to a parade or something he had a made me his little champion for a while. Didn't work a lot. You know, I got to work with two cold Scorpio and uh, the honky tonk man out there. And, you know, the honky tonk man, I remember he was sitting there and he's looking at me and I worked with him a few times before, but I was with the Savotis, I believe I might've been the hammer, but anyway, and I did a job for him for New York. And he looked at me, and says, okay, what are we going to do? I go, you don't have to leave your feet tonight. He goes, what? I said, I'm going to rake your back. I'm going to give you some punch to the stomach. I'll put my thumb in your eye. Tonight, you don't have to leave your back. He threw his hands behind his head, leaned back. He said, that's the best news I ever heard. He goes, go, what? He goes, last night in Phoenix, this young kid ain't been in the business one year. He wants to do the Hurricane Corona on me and all these moves. You know what I'm saying? He wants to go on the top rope and this and that. And I say, shit, I got to I got to go to school and teach school Monday. He goes, you know, this kid, you know, I said, well, tonight, tonight you don't have to leave your feet. And uh, we were in the match. We're working. He goes, body slam me. Do this. Do that. You know, once he realized he was in good hands, he had no problem. And that's something else, you know. Um, I never liked nobody that took advantage of somebody in the ring. Because in the mm-hmm. ring, you're giving your body to somebody. Okay, you know, I'm here to do a job. And uh, and I'm, uh, I'm going to do my job. But, you know, don't kick me in the back of the head. Bruno San Martinez kid kicked me in the back of the head one time. I go, strike one. And this is on in, in Staten Island. And now he kicks me in the head again two times. And I got up. I told him, hey, I hooked him in, hooked his arm in a rope. I did a little shoot and move on him. I got him tangled in the ropes. And I told him, I'm going to beat your ass right here on your little TV program. He goes, oh, he goes, I said, you hit, kick me in the head again. And he, and after that, he wouldn't work. So finally I told him, I said, hey, buddy, you got to work. You're the star of the show. They want to see you work. You got you got to do something. So he fired back up, but he never kicked me in the head again. Because when he kick you in the back of the head, you can't protect yourself. You got your face away from it. So, uh, I did. Uh, you know, I made more mistakes being a wrestler. I could have did a little, probably a little better, but uh, I got no complaints. You know what I'm saying? Right. None whatsoever. Um, Taz, we used to see Taz a lot. He did quite well in the business. You know, I'm happy for him. Uh, Tommy Dream was, like I said, he was a good young man. And uh, Vince, Vince McMahon, I'm sitting down, and I'm watching him walk by and hear one of the other boys. I'm not going to mention his name. He passed away lately, a few years ago, actually. And he goes, something Caesar. I look at him. I said, Caesar. And, you know, they kind of bad mouth. I'm thinking to myself, you know, you making – Three hundred fifty to four hundred thousand dollars a year, and you're going to say something bad to him. And uh, I go to leave the show one night, and who was out there? He walks up and shakes my hand. He goes, "Thank you for coming to the show." He said, "Without young men like you, I can't have a show." So you know his persona that people see on t- on TV is one thing, but he understood the business quite well. You know what I'm saying? That's so, right. You know, you, you know he, he's not a, really a, uh, that bad a guy now. They had a young man, I don't know if you know him. I seen I met him with the Savoldis was Broadway Sonny Blaze. Uh, and then I, I seen interviewed, Broadway. I interviewed Sonny recently, actually. Is his his first interview ever, uh, just about two months ago, and he was afraid that he'd have nothing to talk about. We ended up going just over an hour. So he uh he was well, very fun to talk to. Sonny was a very nice guy, man. He was great. When I when I seen him at the WWF show, and I'm not saying nothing bad about him because he really excelled afterwards. Right. He um uh, he had, uh he was wearing some blue jeans and he had some Converse tennis shoes on. He had wore the backup model, and he had a uh, his shirt you know was just pulled over and his hair was kind of messy and he had some long fingernails. I said, hey buddy, mind if I give you a little pointers? Yeah, I uh, no problem. I said when you come, this is the WWF. I said when you come to the WWF. You need to, uh, you know, respect this business. It's the number one wrestling organization in the world. I said, what you should do is come up here, wear your nice little polo shirt, some slacks, some shoes, some nice little loafers, cut your fingernails, brush your teeth, and always, always use underarm deodorant. He looked at me, and I, so now we're in Cutcher's, New York. And I watch him work, and he's not really smooth. And most probably I could be a little better, too, but 
I said, Sonny, you need to get in the ring and train more. He goes, yeah, well, I need to. And I said, well, you need to go to over here, over there. He said, well, we can go to Titan Towers. I said, we can. He goes, yeah. And he said, by the way, he goes, uh, Pat and uh, Terry told me to tell you thank you for pointing me in the right direction. I said, Pat. And I didn't don on it. It was Pat Patterson and Terry Garvin. And you never know when you befriend somebody, being nice to somebody who they know. My pay increased after that. And pretty much they, you know, they were real nice to me after that. You know, the, the company, they never get, you know, I'm not one that was looking for the push with the company. You follow me? I knew right. my part and I was going to go do my job. If I could work two times that night, I carried a king out one night, got my hair cut one night, made just under a thousand dollars. I thought it was the best stuff in the world. You know, I'd take off work and go and go work. You mentioned Jake earlier. I'm uh, working at Long Island, Hempstead, Long Island, in a trash burner. Uh, the good Lord bless me with eye hand coordination. I can weld a nuclear powerhouse. I passed a uh, TIG test, and I, I'm real good at it. I work good chrome weld. And the general foreman, the head fell on the job for the pipe fitters, come up and rub my neck one day. He go, okay, Mikey? You okay? How's your neck feeling? I said, it's all right. Why? He goes, me and Billy, that's his son. We wanted to pull for you the other day when you were wrestling Jake, but Jake's our favorite wrestler. That's back. And believe me, I, I stayed on that job longer than any other traveler. And I was a traveler. And uh, they t- took care of me quite well. So but you never know who the wrestling fan is. Right. They're all over the place, you know. <laughs> so especially today, oh, wrestling is humongous today. I don't know if you continue to watch today, but there's – you know, a lot of people watch today. So, uh, um, go ahead. I watch a little TV, but not much. Yeah. I don't, you know, I'll, yeah. I'll read stuff. I'll read more than I've ever read before. And uh, another guy that was real good to me, and uh, I like him, was Tom Brandy. And he almost like did a few different gimmicks. Uh, Salvador Sinceri did that, and uh, Tom Chippendale Brandy. I got to work yep. with him several nights in a row on a European tour. And he stays healthy. He got two good looking kids and uh good athletes. He's a winner. I like him. Yeah. I always liked him. I, I saw one of his earliest dates in the WWF uh in New Haven, Connecticut, at the old New Haven Coliseum. Did you ever work there at the Coliseum in New Haven? I, I worked in, uh, in Hartford, Connecticut. Okay. I worked in All right. Hartford. All right. And, uh, I, that I, was my first match. Go... It was with Sam Houston. I busted his mouth oh wow <laughs> yeah i was you know I, i've been working on these little shows where you know you can pretty much go out there and call what you're going to do you know what i'm saying and so we right. thought we would do it. i said okay i said duck duck a close i'm gonna give you an elbow he didn't want to take a bump and i threw that elbow up there he ran right into it and busted his mouth you know hey man you busted my mouth i said well, should have took the bump you know but his brother stuck my stuck my head in the in the bag with a snake that night and oh, Sonny Beach, he told me, he goes, I walked in the dressing room, I knew Sonny. He goes, ah, oh, you made it up here, huh? I said, yeah. I said, uh, Mr. Garvin booked me. He goes, uh, who you working with? I said, I work with anybody. I don't really care. I just don't want to work with Jake because uh, <laughs> cause, uh, I'm scared of snakes. And so he runs around the back and goes tells the chief, you know, Jay Strongbow. Yep. Uh, he goes, see, Williams is scared of snakes. And I didn't find out till later on. And he walks in there, he goes, Mike Williams. Yes, sir. He goes, you're working with Jake tonight. Oh, oh shit. I can't stand snakes. And I lay there. I did the DDT. Matter of fact, they give me, I was a job boy of the week a few years later. They said that was the job was the job boy of the week on, on that match. He ddt me. And uh, all of a sudden, he slid across, and I feel that bag over my head. I said, oh, no. I can smell that snake, and I can smell the piss on it. I said, he is not sticking my head in the bag. And he shook it up home. So, oh man, it's just something else. But he would have, uh, we went to Germany with him. He, he snuck over a, a Cobra, King Cobra, in his, uh, in his luggage. They didn't even check it. And he, that Cobra eventually died on him. But he would, uh, he'd keep it in the shower room where they had little steam heaters. He'd lay on top of the steam heaters to keep it warm because it was cool in Germany, kind of cold, actually, a little humid. Oh, getting grayish, but uh, like I said, he's a good guy. You know, I've and met his him. Daddy once. is a good man. I, I was saw, yeah. 
Yeah, I met Jake once. I saw him do his speaking tour about three, four years ago, and it was very entertaining. He had some great stories. So. Oh, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't the, doubt it. Uh, yeah. In uh, 1990. I, I got to hang uh, out with Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm listening to you. Oh, yeah. I just want to know in 1990, uh, you uh, teamed up with uh, Durham uh, to form the Equalizers. It was Zip and Zap. And. Uh, some of you guys, I guess, considered compared you to the Minnesota Wrecking Crew, and uh, what was that? What was that like? And uh, also, you teamed up as the Mad Russians as well. Yes, uh, Johnny, I got Mike Durham, which is he related to words Johnny Grunge, right? I uh, started wrestling, and uh, he come to my house one day, and I don't know him from Adam, and I hear somebody knock on my door. And this little fat baby face kid with blonde hair with a bold haircut tells me, I want to be a wrestler. I looked at him, and at that point there, I was you know, like Terry Taylor, they, they don't want you to cafe the business. So I reached right. over and I chopped him one time, two times, three times. He's about 275 pounds, and I snatch him in my living room in a, in a headlock, and I make him take a, a neck breaker. And I rolled down into a position like to wrestle. I was, you know, in a in a in an amateur wrestling stance. And he, he got up and he started wobbling like Dusty Rose. And he started doing his work punches. I said, "Man, where where did you learn how to wrestle at?" He said, "I, I wrestled at Grandma Durham's." He said, "We bust out all the mattresses, and I'm the international mattress wrestling champion." I said, "Oh my God!" Uh, I said, "Kid, I, I can help. I can help you out in the business." And uh, we helped him out, you know. I hooked him up with some people and he eventually, you know, learned how to work in the business, but people like him and, uh, imagine Mick Foley be the same way. They love wrestling. They knew it before they got involved with it. With me, I didn't, I didn't watch wrestling till I started doing it. Like I said, I, I come from a family where everybody boxed, you know what I'm saying? And, uh, but I, I imagine the most probably, I'm not punch drunk, so most probably was the best thing happened for me, you know, getting involved with wrestling. And like I say, you know, travel around and uh, shoot and eat good. Yeah. I watched, uh, I watched Nikolai Volkov in this, uh, we're in, I want to say outside of Vienna, Austria. And he always wears a sweater with the pockets in it. <laughs> and I watch him get two biscuits, two apples, and he takes the way he wraps it. I'm watching. He wraps and slides into his little pouch under, you know, in this switch where you put your hands at, your hand warmer. So he loads that stuff up. So I said, look at that. You know what I'm saying? He's, he's, he's not going to pay for his next meal. Good guy. You know, I, I played chess with him. He realized I know I played chess. But several years ago, later on, and Tom Brandy had booked a little show in Las Vegas. And I, I didn't, wasn't on the show, but Johnny Grunge was on it. And, and so was, uh, Ted Petty and, uh, and Nikolai Volkov. And, uh, so I watched him, he was watching me and had these real good cookies. And this was Mandalay Bay. And it was a, all kind of nice cookies. What a spread. So I went over there. I had a lunchbox with me. I don't know how I got the lunchbox. Anyway, I took all the good cookies and wrapped them up and I put them in that lunchbox. I'm taking them home. I got four girls now. They can eat these good cookies. And I'll be damned out of the corner of my eye while I wasn't looking. Nick goes over and slides about four cookies out of it. And I looked at him, he goes, only four of them. <laughs> I said, yeah. I just smiled and laughed. You know what I'm saying? I did it intentionally because uh, I've seen him do something like that before. You know? Right. So he was a good, good guy. They got a lot of characters in that business. You know what I'm saying? Yes. They, uh, they, they always World did great. It's, uh, it's, it's fun, I guess you could say. <laughs> There's a lot how of characters. Like... In the business? What's that? How did, how did you get involved in the business? Yeah. Radio, basically. I was, uh, I, yeah. I did college radio, uh, public radio. Uh, I did a show back in the day, and then I was supposed to be starting up another one. I had not been involved in wrestling and at all really uh outside of writing and uh wrote for a website back in the day and then uh and then uh basically what ended up happening is uh i kind of lost interest for a couple years and then i i and then i um 
you know, I started, I, I divorced my first wife, met my second wife a few years later. Her son was like really into it. And uh, basically I uh, was looking to get back into radio and it ended up being, I ran into Paul Roma at a gas station on my way into the office one day. And he invited me down to see a show of his. And I literally, um, I've, I've been to pretty much every show that his school has run uh, uh, since in the last four years. And I ended up doing commentary there, uh, working some camera work and another such things, you know. So that's what that's basically what I did. Where does yeah. he run? Is, uh, he's out of Connecticut? It's East Haven, Connecticut. Him and Mario Mancini run a school together right outside of East Haven, right inside East Haven, Connecticut, I should say. It's about uh, 10 minutes outside of New Haven. And they put on a really great product. I've uh, you know, I've been very supportive of their product. Uh, they got a big show coming this Saturday at their school, uh, the 22nd of April. And yeah, man, it's just, I felt it basically that first appearance that I went, that I ran into people I had not seen in a number of years. Uh, that were in the business and i literally was just damn this is awesome like i i missed it so much you know so i uh basically from then on in i got became obsessed again <laughs> you know and uh, started to do this now i'm pushing 50 so i'm just having a blast doing what i'm doing oh, i passed 50 a long time ago <laughs> yeah <laughs> Yeah, man, and I, I just, it, and I wanted to start a you know start a radio show up again. Basically, it was what my goal was. But then, after that first wrestling show, with me going to this show, I said, you know, fuck this, I'm doing a wrestling podcast. <laughs> so, and that's how it basically started. After that, I started talking about a lot of local wrestling. That's how I started. First off, I couldn't do an episode past like 15 minutes, and then over time, I just progressed and got better. And now here I am today. We're pushing for 300 episodes and. There's a lot going on now. I'm oh, like this podcast. This podcast mm -hmm. has been so busy the last like ever since January. We're just like really cooking. So there's a lot. You know, I just interviewed Jacques Rougeau earlier today uh, for the podcast on a future episode. Good, good for you. Uh, yeah. Frank DeFalco runs a little wrestling on that Future Stars of Professional Wrestling in Las Vegas. Now, he I started out yep. at first. He, he started out doing a radio talk show, and Buffalo Jim Bear would tell me, "Hey, go to the go there and be on this show and put over our business, his business, the PWF." And like I say, Buff always paid me good money, but he sent me somewhere he paid me. So you know, shit, this is you know, I, I'm I'm not even taking bumps getting paid. I like that. But that Frank DeFalco, uh, I remember him. He yeah. started out as a radio, and then he it's maybe still got a little business going on over there. I, I wish him well. Future stars of professional wrestling. Him and uh, the other boy had a school in Las Vegas. I went to work for him for a while after I left Buffalo. Was uh, Gary Mills? He called himself Rush. And uh, we had uh, he run a little TV program. We called it Cheap TV. It was just on the antenna air. And uh, they'd come down to this little school, and every Friday night we'd run a free show for the public, you know. And then yeah. Pat Patterson come down there one time because Nick Bockwinkel was working with us. And Nick was, a, he's just a gentleman, you know, uh, he was a, a master yeah. worker though. I got this so right here. Speaking of Nick you know Bockwinkle, I want to show you something. Speaking of Nick Bockwinkle, I have this sitting right here on my yeah. desk. His AWA world title, a replica of his AWA world title. So that's how much of a, of a oh. fan of his I am. So see, well, there he, you go. He's a linguist. I like that. He, uh, yeah. he can, uh, he used words to baffle people. Yeah, I mean, because he would get, you know, he would take them young boys and he'd pull them off to the side, you know, and would he'd work with them cutting promos and all that. And that's what you see a lot in the WWF. You know, if you sit in the back, you'll see them. They take like Shawn Michaels. They pull them off to the side. It's not the moves in the ring. They said, man, you got to keep your face up where they can see you. You know, if you're mm -hmm. looking down at the mat, they can't see your face. They can tell if you're hurt or set. So I would, I would, you know, I would sit around and watch that kind of stuff. And uh, but the WWF, if you if you were out there bad mouthing them, and they can make money off of you, they make money off of you. And I'm not talking about me. I'm talking about the stars, and they kind of twisted things, you know. God yeah. rest his soul. But Dusty Rhodes, you know, 
when he was in the NWA, he was with the movie stars and all that stuff. When he got to New York, they put him with that little black woman, and then a sapphire. And they right. were kind of insulting him. Then they put him with pol- polka dots on him. And like, you know, they said, I watched this stuff in the back, you know. So, oh, shit, these people are vicious. You know what I'm saying? But he made, you know, he was over no matter what. You could do anything you wanted with him. He was still over, but I'm pretty sure it didn't sit well with him. You know what I'm saying? Well, you know, I think I saw on that on that documentary that he, he you know, if he was going to go out there and do it, he was going to make the best of it because he wasn't going to sit there and be insulted. He's just going to, you know, he, if anybody could get it over, I think Dusty is the guy that could get it over. He... I mean, he wasn't a bodybuilder, you know what I'm saying? That was big. Yeah. Uh, he, you know, at that time they used monsters and he was over. And yeah. of course he's been around for a long time. And his boy was a very good talent. Yeah. I, I think Dustin now, was, uh, uh, was awesome. Oh, and now, is he still in shape? Dude. <laughs> for 60, what's he, 60 years old, 60 something years old. He still looks like he did on TV back in the day. Like it's no joke. He, he still looks. Physique. Yeah, he still looks like he did back in the day. Like you wouldn't, you know. Uh, he looks just incredible for sixty. I think he's like sixty or sixty-two or something like that. I don't want to throw. I don't want to make him sound older than he actually is. But he looks incredible for you know. Like I said, like he did on TV back in the day. Still to this day. And, and he'll go out there and work a match or two. Uh, I think he traveled somewhere and worked a match. I know we refereed a match, he, uh, you know, here. But he doesn't uh, – I mean, I think he's just pretty much the head trainer there. So I don't really talk to him that much. But, uh, you know, he's a, he's a good guy. I really liked him a lot growing up watching him on TV. He was working with uh, – they didn't know the stallion gimmick. And from that, they involved into uh, – he went to work with her, Ray Hernandez. Yeah. There was uh, him and Jimmy Powers, and then they they split up, and then he uh, he teamed up with, uh, and then they, he teamed up with uh, Hercules and became uh, Power and Glory. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. That uh, he passed away, Ray, but uh, Ray was special. I Me, mean, uh, first time I run into Ray, I was trying to just trying to get in the business of that. So go to Central Gym in uh in Baton Rouge. And the Rouse was always there about 12 o'clock. So I go down there, you know, I'm going to meet the Rouse. I'm going to see there's Nikolai Volkov squatting. And uh, Ray has climbs under about 300, I want to say 65 pounds. And he bangs it out for about 15 reps. Well, the other boy with him lays down under it, and he struggles to get one. And Ray kind of jumps. Man, you, you should have got that. What's wrong? I said, he had to get it, I said, you know, and I don't know him from nobody. I'm just, I should have kept my mouth shut. He goes, I go, he had to get it. You weren't going to help him. And he he turned and made an about face and got in front of me, and he started breathing. I looked at that big old traps because he was doing most probably the Mr. Rasslin three gimmick or something in, uh, right. in Louisiana at that time. And he was breathing at me. <sighs> I said, oh, shit. And all of a sudden, God bless me because Nikolai Volkov looked at him and goes, hey, hey, Ray. Come over here and spot me. And just that quick, he turned around, walked over and spotted him. I said, this is a sign for you to run, Mike. I never run from a fight in my life. But I could tell, you know what I'm saying, the bigger they are, the harder they hit, and he could hurt you. I walked out of there, and I left. And a little later on in life, I met him in, on a few times. I did a job for him for New York, and then uh, we were on a, on a tour through uh, Germany and that. He was, he was a, I believe he was the main event. He worked, worked against the Warrior. But he, uh, look. Great guy. Now, if he gets drunk, yeah. watch him. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but uh, I guess wrestling is like a just so, so many variety of people. I know this yeah. one day I went to the, uh, the WWF and uh, I see a fella got a Bible out and they had Black Bart. He had a, a film stream magazine and I seen the, the rockers and the bulldogs, they were putting jokes on each other. One of them cut the other one's uh, holes in their pants out. <laughs> and the other one put shaving cream in the other one shoes, you know what I'm saying? So it's just a, a wide variety of people, you know? And then you see somebody like Rick Rude, he carries his vitamins in with him and takes all his vitamins and all that. So a good group ever, of people. 
were you ever a victim of any uh, any good ribs? Uh, years ago, I was. Uh, yeah. I was told from girls wanted to meet me when they called my hotel room. And Lynn Denton, which was the graph where it did that. We worked with Buck okay. Robley. But I pretty much try to stay out of and I'm not so much stay out of sight. I just, uh, you know, when you're not on top, I didn't, I didn't pretend like I was on top. You know what I'm saying? I went there right. as a professional to do a job for them. Now, with the Savoldis, they were saying, you know, that's where I got a lot of experience in. You know, they let me work a few times a night. And we'd run a little, run a little bit. And uh, Johnny Ross helped me out a whole lot, you know, uh, just working in the ring. And uh, another man that helped me out was, he called himself Tom Jones. I worked with him in uh, San Antonio, Texas for the NWA. I think the main event that night was uh, Magnum TA and Ric Flair. And, uh, the Rock and Roll Express were wrestling the war, uh, the Road Warriors. They had all the all the stores were on there. It was so nice, and uh, I worked with Tom Jones that night. So he had run a. They had a place called uh, Texas All Store. Had a place where they did a little TV filming called The Junction. And uh, their main their main store at the time was Scott Casey, and Scott could really work. He would do a double gimmick. He Russell Scott Casey later on. He come out as the Midnight Rider. But uh, a lot of them boys go to the WWF and uh, they don't really get get a push because it's back to the. There's only so many people that can get a push. Right. You, you follow me? Not everybody yeah. gets pushing that business. Iron Mike Sharps. When he was in Louisiana, he was a champion. You know what I'm saying? Not up there. When he first so, went into WWF, he got a push. He wrestled Backlund, I think, at Madison Square Garden for the title, if I remember correctly. Maybe it was a spectrum, but he got a push like when he first came in, and uh, then he got brought down the uh, brought down the card. You know, I guess his times were changing. Oh, Mike Sharp's did. Yeah, Honestly, if you if you you, you if I you got yeah, if you have a, I don't know if you have Peacock or not, but there's like a section where they have like those. If you remember those. Uh, um, Televised house shows they do on like, you know, the Philadelphia channel, whatever that channel was, and then uh, the MSG oh. network and stuff like that. Yeah, they, they, that matches up there somewhere. I, I've seen it before. So, yeah, he was they made a big deal about him when he first came in. I mean, at the time, he had, you know, prior to becoming a preliminary guy, he was basically had a legendary career, you know, in Canada and stuff. So well, in the South, he was big. Grizzly yeah. Smith loved him. Uh and Bill Watts was loved him, and they, you know, he was all, he was over here, and that's why I was amazed when I seen him up there. But you know, we were overseas, and he'd call his mama every day, stop what he was doing, call his mama. I said I, I felt bad because I didn't call my mom every day. <laughs> wow, you know, he's just a person like that, you know. Yeah. Yep. Uh, let's see here. What else do I got here for questions here? There's a lot of stuff here. We don't got to go for that long, but, uh, let's see here. Uh, I'm trying to remember. I was just watching some of that footage over there on, um, do you know the Savoldi's launched a streaming network and they started uploading a lot of TV and, uh, I've seen quite a bit of you. Some of the shows that they're uploading are complete shows rather than the regular TV tapings. And, there was times, like you said, I've seen you three or four times watching the same exact event. So some of them were like right back to back. Yeah, they were, they were pushing us back out. Of, you know, but for us, that was good. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Because uh, you get, you, well, you can work better. If you, if you, if you're not in the ring working, and that's what, what uh, I said about, I'd go to Brooklyn, 29 Front Street, Brooklyn, the Gleason's gym. That's where Johnny Ross was. Yeah. And he just pretty much, uh, he opened the door from some little stuff from that. Mondo Colleen was there for a while, which I believe he came up Phil Dr. Demento. And he produced yep. a lot, a lot of good boys that made it to the WWF Johnny Ross did. You know. Now he's most probably good friends with Pat Patterson, I'm pretty sure. Most probably good friends with Vince Jr. So uh but you yeah, can't was, you um, can't send that many people. Yeah, I think that you, Johnny Rods had like an instant connection. I think with the WWF, a lot of his guys would go there and, and learn. And of course, with the Savoldis too, he was feeding them to the Savoldis as well, I believe. Well, that's where uh, 
Tommy, that's where I met well, I met Tommy Dreamer at, at Gleason's and um we told um they already knew about him. We told Tony Rumble about Tommy Dreamer and Taz. He said, Yeah, we're gonna be having them on a show coming up soon. I don't talk to him. I said, Yeah, they're talented. But you've seen several talented boys at Johnny Ross. He had some boys called the, the Towers. Okay. Uh, yep. two big tall boys there. And uh did you know the Power Twins, Dave and Larry Santag? I yeah, I know them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know who they are. Yes. Uh, I tried to reach out to one of them. I think it was, I don't remember which one, but uh, he was, ba he's basically still the same. He's in character all the time when he responded to me and then I never heard from him ever again. Yeah. Dave and Larry Santag. Yep. They, uh, I got to Las Vegas and I guess Larry was, uh, Dave was still in uh, New York, but I went and seen Larry cause I'd worked with him a few times and, uh, he told me, the best thing you got to remember when you go somewhere around here, always tip. If it's just a buck or two bucks, and that was the best advice I could ever got. I was doing a uh, a talk show at the ESPN Zone. It was a wrestling program. They had uh, it at uh, uh, one of the casinos, like a castle. Right. Anyway, I go over there to the, the ESPN Zone, and uh, – I tipped that little girl. All I had was five dollars. I didn't have no change, just a five. So I gave her a five dollar bill. The next time I come to on that talk show, she told me just park, park up front. I got your car. So I said he was right. Tip is the best thing. That's in Las Vegas. Always tip them. Uh, that's how them people live out there. Yeah. Uh, did you go to work for the AWF at one point? And do you have any memories of that? The AWF? You know, let me see here. I don't think so. You don't think that was? All right. Uh, let's see. I think that's uh, pretty much that. Um, yeah, what was it like uh, when uh, Dusty Wolf became part of the Equalizers? Do you remember that? He became... Uh, oh, it was great. Yeah, Zoom, correct, right? Yeah. He, we wrestle... Uh, you ever heard of Spudnik Monroe? Of course. We yes. wrestle in yep. Louisiana, too. Yeah, we Sonny King and Spudnik Monroe and Bubba Monroe, his son, who passed away, I believe, this past year. Mm -hmm. Well, Dusty would be on the shows with us. And, uh, Dusty was uh, he just a good person. I was very yeah. happy to see him up there. He would he'd fly in. I'd pick him up at the airport. He'd just stay at the house with me. I had me a house in New Jersey. And uh, I never could in my mind leaving Louisiana and go to New Jersey. And you got to pay $1,350 a month. This is 1988 for a house. I thought it was outrageous. They could buy one. And when they told me what the taxes was, I said, I just didn't rent it. <laughs> you, know? yeah. you get, you, are in debt the rest of your life, you know, yeah. to buy a house in New Jersey. But yeah. Dusty Wolf was, a. Uh, I never could get him to, to lift weights and stay in the gym a long time. I don't want to be a muscle head. He would say, and I would watch him work with people. And I call it outworking them. In other words, he would be on top the whole match. They would do something. He countered. He was really, really good worker. And at the very end, he'd put him over. You know what I'm saying? I said, Dusty, man, you, you made him look bad to the very end. He says, you know, no. I said, okay, Dusty. But he was a, a good worker. Him and Ken Timms worked together for a while. Out of Atlanta. Oh, yeah, I remember him. And then yep. he worked with Ken, Ken Jones. If, uh, if you find a little niche in the business, that's what Ricky Ferrar told me, Phil brought me in the business. He says, just find your little niche. He said, you'll do okay. And uh, But you got to go somewhere to work. That's the trick. Right now, there's really no place to work. I see a lot of people work for, uh, and I, I hate to say this, they'll work for nothing, you know what I'm saying, just to be on a show. And that's not really a professional. And some of them can actually really work. But that, to me, it cheapens the business a little bit. And I'm not, I'm not mad had it nobody for doing i can understand the desire to be in the business right but you get paid you know what i'm saying if you yeah. if you lower your standards and you don't get paid you know what i'm saying it's uh next thing you know they take they try and take advantage of people like that all the time yeah. uh did you work for herb abrams uwf at any point several times yeah uh, i worked for him several times and then most probably me doing that most probably caused a small internal conflict with the uh, ICW. 
Okay. But is, I was at the point where all I want to do is, well, because, you know, I, I did jobs for the WWF and they put us over as their tag team champions. And mm-hmm. then, you know, then I go work for, then I go work for another group where they weren't feeding. I couldn't work enough to get better if I just worked for just them. Right. They had several boys that worked just for them. I'm not going to mention no names. They didn't, they weren't, they didn't, I, I become better as I got because I worked as much as I could. But these boys could have been better if they had worked a little more. You know, just, you got the, you have to get in the ring to work. And like I got in Las Vegas, I didn't get to, uh, didn't have a lot of shows, but I worked for two different schools. One with uh, Rodney and Noe and the other with uh, Nick Bockwink and Scott Casey. Right. And I was in the ring several days a week with, uh, you know, you, <laughs> Before I let one of them kids start doing bumps, I let them work with me before he broke somebody else's nose or something like that. Right. And I got potatoed a bunch, but good kids, but you know what I'm saying? Uh, most probably Paul Roma tell you, he got, he got potatoed a few times. Right. Tell me what, you know, but there was nothing, you know, there was nothing else for me to really do. And I kept saying, man, if I could get back to New York, you know what I'm saying? Because I'd, uh, I got along with Shawn Michaels. We weren't good friends, but Shawn Michaels, is a type of person if he liked you and you you know he he could get you on the card, you know. And if you could be a a, a Barry Horowitz, that's good enough sometimes, you know. Right. Barry Horowitz, uh, I watched him; he was very professional, you know. But he was the Florida Championship uh, heavyweight champion in Florida at one time. Yep, that's where Sunny Beach come from too. But uh, you know, like what I say earlier. Better to be a, to go start a motion picture. See, so start a motion picture and make it to the WWF. So right. it's, you know, it's a hard egg to crawl. Yeah, you know? yeah, I got you. I believe that. Uh, let's see here. I think that's. Oh, did you ever wrestle uh, Kevin Von Erich? Uh, I wrestled Mike and Kerry. I'm pretty sure I wrestled Kevin. I just can't remember Mike. where it was at. Okay. My uh, mind this comes was in, in, well, in, in 1991, uh, Kevin came in for a shot with uh, for the Savoldis, actually. For, I think that he, uh, from what I understand, what he told me, uh, I think he did one TV taping for them, and I think he worked something like four matches. That's when uh, World Class and the Savoldis uh, merged at one point. I, I picked I him up that. at the airport that night. Yeah? Yeah. Uh, he, stay, he, stay with me. he stayed with me that night, and uh, I run out of gas in Newark, New Jersey. And we pulled over. He goes, and I'm not I'm not gonna use no derogatory terms. He goes, this is a rough part of town, huh? I said, Yes, it is. <laughs> so <laughs> and uh, my little cousin was with us and uh he couldn't he just the look taking bumps and all that is a little more than you think. My little cousin couldn't he he learned how to wrestle, did real good, but and he he had a, a good body. But it really just getting beat up. He didn't really care for it too much. I'm not so I'm doing the job. I'm talking just a physical wrestling. Right. But he, uh, him, him and uh, Kevin stayed at the car while I flagged the policeman down to go get me some gas. And that policeman goes, "You're in the rough part of town." And uh, so some people come by. And they would come up. They were checking. Uh, they were outside the car, standing outside the car. And uh, Kevin tells my my little cousin, "Just get behind me." I'll take care of everything. If it goes there, I'll take care of everything. I said, wow. He was he was ready. So <laughs> but shit. He said, I'll take care of everything. There's a little more to it than that, but I'll just leave it at that. Right. But yeah. I yeah. come back got to the gap and got him home. He, he was a good a good guy. Uh, uh, I believe they just made a movie with him in New Orleans. Uh, it's a, not out. It's not out yet, but it's coming out. And uh, that's something I'm really, really looking forward to to seeing because uh I was a huge world class fan growing up. I would watch that every single day after school when it was on ESPN when I was uh, in school. So I'm pretty excited uh, the, to see this movie coming out, the Von Erichs movie. Yeah, uh, see, I wrestled Mike Von Erich's last TV match, and okay. I just seen it lately. And I said, "Boy, I wish I'd have seen it sooner," because when I, I was coming up on the mat and I had my butt up in the air, he was still holding me down. At that time, you know, like I say. I should have slid in close and kind of picked him up as I want to go up. But that's what the TV is, you know, it's good. You can really correct yourself with it. And I should have used TV more to more of my advantage as a tool. Right. Uh, the Von Erich's, uh, 
And I even met the little Chris, but I never worked with Chris. Uh, Carrie just, me and Carrie go to the gym a few times. I've hung around a few times. I wrote some shows with him. I like Carrie. It's a shame what happened to him, you know what I'm saying? Because in yeah. life, you know, it don't really matter all your heartaches and problems you have today when you wake up tomorrow morning and not as bad as they seem. You know what I'm saying? That's why I had a little kid want to commit suicide a while back, and I told him, say, look, man, just go to sleep and wake up in the morning, and I promise you, your troubles won't be as bad as you think. And he told me the next day, he goes, you're right. And I said, what? He said, my problems really ain't that bad. I said, not, not bad enough to kill yourself. Shit. You know, so. Life is hard, life, but there's always an answer. Yeah. Oh, yes. Uh, but wrestling, like I said, are, uh, always make the people happy. Let yep. them go home happy with a smile on their face. So I like uh, I like what the Rocket said. And uh tell you who, who did real good with this business is uh Paul Heyman. When I first got to New Jersey and I went to the NWF they had Mike Dano and DC Mad Dog Drake and Larry Winters and a bunch of those boys were there and uh they had some TV filming and uh Paul Heyman had worked with them. Paul has been mm-hmm. in the business since he was a kid. And he's worked his way right up the ladder to one of the top slots. There's very few people who stayed around as long as he has. A lot of them have come and gone. Mm-hmm. And I heard him say one day, and I was just, he got along real good with Ted Petty and uh, Mike Durham. John yeah. Grunge, and he told, uh, he said one day I heard him say somebody, I was hanging around, he goes, all I need is three minutes. And somebody said, three minutes, that's nothing. I said three minutes. If you that's all he needed to get over was three minutes. If you right. get three minutes, that's enough. He can get over. Apparently, he he used that three minutes to a lot of leverage because look where he's at today. And yeah. I was telling somebody the day, the Samoans. That's who he was putting over back then was Alfin Sika. Right. He's putting over one of uh, he's putting over Samoans now. Yep. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's a, it's a small business. You know what I'm saying? So, uh, I'd asked, they told me a woman to go work for the ECW and, uh, I just I had a baby and we moved to uh, Louisiana. I figured I'd raise my kid down here and all that Madison Square Garden, supposedly was on Madison Square Garden. So I was seen on TV a little bit, not greatly, but enough. And I get booked on little shows here for a buck and a half a night, but you know, they're so far away. And next thing you show up to some little place, you know? And you realize that these boys really can't work. They just, they're like backyard wrestlers. They got a ring somewhere. Yeah. And they're just, and so I, I, I kind of started staying away from that. They were paying me good money, but you know, it's like, I felt like I was, uh, you know, I, I want my trans and a hundred and a half. The trans cost me $45 for gas. And I guess 45 <laughs> bucks and a half, just under $12. I was happy, but I felt like, you know, I know they didn't make that kind of money at the gate. You know what I'm saying? I may right. be the only person on the show that actually, that actually ever worked anywhere. And but I worked for Lolly Griffin and uh was it Griffin Lolly? Lolly dude, they call him. He was a uh he was on radio and that and he become he ended up doing a Lolly dude in the GWF. And he would book shows out of Kosciuszko, uh, Mississippi. But that's a nine hour drive from where I'm at. You know right. what I'm saying? And uh he'd have like Dutch Mantel, Scandor, Akbor, a bunch of them boys from world class would go over there and work for him. Uh, Superstore Bill Dundee. I got to work with Superstore Bill Dundee one time with him. And uh, several other people. Boy, I sort of, you know, just talking about it, I sort of realized, you know, I put a lot of miles under me. You know, but uh, it would be being an entertainer ain't bad. Yeah. It sounds like you had a really interesting career, man. I I, uh, I enjoyed talking to you, man. I appreciate it. Uh, yeah, but the the northeast coast is where if you want if you want to wrestle, yeah, that's where you want to be because uh, like SD Jerry Jones, they flew into Bahamas and and the Svoli flew into the, the Cayman Islands, and people brought me up to Canada on independent shows. And you're when you're there, you're in the limelight. When you move right. from there. You know, Woodbridge, New Jersey, Principia, New Jersey, and you move back to Louisiana, you know what I'm saying? And they're not paying, they're not flying you up, you know what I'm saying? 
So, you know, and I'm not, I'm not mad about it. Just that's reality. I should have never left New Jersey, but I like, like I said, in the very beginning, I made a lot of money being a professional wrestler. I mean, I tell you, I made a lot, I made a lot of stupid money. You know, you don't know who the fan is. I love the right. wrestling fan. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. Well, Mike, how many, I want to, how, uh, how many do I do a week? Yeah. Oh, I do two a week. I, however, I have six sitting in the can waiting. <laughs> I record oh, a bunch more. Yeah. So, um, my plan is to build up enough shows that I could, uh, you know, I'm going to take some time off in June, but have enough shows to continue to drop, uh, you know, as I'm still, you know, take some time off because I'm, uh, I'm booked several shows a day for the next uh, all the way through May. So I'm, I'm looking to, <laughs> to take a little break because it's I got to tell you, I work a lot. And then I do this on top of it. You know what I mean? I do this uh, a, a, an awful what, lot. It's what just, work do you do besides? Well, I've work? never I've never worked. I've never um, revealed my 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 regular job, my day job. Uh Oh, on air before. Right. However, <laughs> no. However, <laughs> I will expose it here. I I work for the Knights of Columbus in uh, New Haven, Connecticut. Uh, I work at their headquarters uh, in New Haven, Connecticut. Uh, they they sell life insurance to you Catholic men. Basically, anybody that's uh, listening <laughs> now knows. <laughs> so, the Knights of Columbus. My uh, my father in law is Filipino, and he's real high up in the Knights of Columbus in in the Philippines, and they come to the United States and. He hooked up with some boys from the Knights of Columbus out over here in Las Vegas. Yeah, they're really big in uh, recent from Las Vegas back in the weekend. Yeah, the yes. company is really big in the, in the in the Philippines. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I was in Bamcock, Thailand last year, really a year and three months ago. Uh, about a year and three months. And uh I tried to fill out if they had any wrestling going over there like they did in Japan. Not yeah. quite the same. <laughs> you know, you know, I was training regularly. I said, you know, even at my age, you know, I can I can still run around the block. So uh, I'll give it a whirl. But uh, it's a little different over there. They wrestle on a mat and stuff like that. Yeah, uh, that's, that's not that's not for me. If it ain't got, if it ain't got no ropes and uh, <laughs> no, I don't want it. <laughs> yeah, Mike, it, um, I want to thank you. For coming on here today this was this was uh exceeded my expectations my friend i'm telling you well thank you it's a pleasure talking to you rick and uh you have a good day keep up the good work you know yeah i'd love maybe to maybe you uh, one day well maybe that is my ultimate dream um i would love to have you back on again in the future because this is uh i'm sure we have lots of great stories to tell as well so uh there's a lot of stuff that's uh you, I can tell you that it would really shock you, but who wants to be hurt, get their feelings hurt about some of their, their stars? You know what I'm saying? So I, I leave a lot of that stuff out. You know, I, I can tell you stuff that just scare you, but that's not really what it's all about, you know? But Rick, thank you very much for uh, getting a hold of me. I appreciate it. It was a pleasure.